I uh, don't know about you, I'm guessing most of you, how many of you played hide and seek when you were growing up? Come on, be honest, you can raise your hands in church, it's okay. How many of you grandparents still play hide and seek with grandkids? All right, yeah. Our granddaughter is not quite old enough yet, but we're looking forward to that. That's one of the favorite games that kids have, and it's really a fun game even as an adult. We enjoy playing hide and seek. It's not as easy to get down on your knees and and hide as it used to be, but uh, it is a fun game to play. And today we're looking at the story of a woman who played hide and seek with Jesus. Uh, She wanted to touch Jesus. We know the game of hide and seek has it, you're it, and you have to try to touch somebody else. And this woman was it, and she wanted to touch Jesus. She had a very specific purpose for touching Jesus, and we'll get more into that in just a minute. One of the most intriguing things to me about Jesus' ministry was his willingness to have these personal encounters with, with people, very diverse people. Uh, you know, to me, I, I think about Jesus and who he was and his message and, and what he tried to bring from heaven to earth. And, and I would have thought that the most important thing he could have done was speak to the crowds, that he could have gathered as many people as possible to say, listen to what I have to share with you that, that God wants to share with you. And Jesus did do that. He spoke through the crowds, but he always made time for individuals, even when there were crowds all around. And it's an interesting variety of individuals he made time for. Religious leaders, yes. (laughs) Roman soldiers, friends, tax collectors, people with illnesses, outcasts, even in naked, demon-possessed man. That must have been an interesting scene to be a part of. I'm going to look at that just for a minute because it's one of the stories right before this story. But Jesus regularly turned aside from the crowds to give his attention to the needs of the individuals. Man, we can never miss that in Scripture. Always notice that. Today's encounter is with this woman trying to play hide and seek with me. I'd encourage you to keep your Bibles open to to Mark 5. I'm going to come back and we will look at the scripture particularly again during the sermon. But I also want to point out some of the the, the, um, background. Whenever I preach, I've only preached a time or two here, but I always want to make sure we put the, the story in context or the passage in context. So I want to look at the background. If you have your Bibles and if you look into chapter 4, you'll see that Jesus began in chapter 4 by teaching crowds. He was teaching in the Sea of Galilee, actually on the, the Galilean side of the Sea of Galilee. And that's important to realize also because the Galilean side of the Sea of Galilee was where all the, the Jewish people lived. So Jesus was speaking primarily to a crowd of of Jews. And if you see in the first part of chapter 4, it it was so crowded that Jesus had to get into a boat. And they pushed him a little bit out into the sea so that he could speak to the people as they stood and sat on the, the seashore and listen to him. When evening came, if you go on in that story, you'll see that he decided he needed to go across to the other side. Now this is important also because on the other side is where the non-Jews lived, primarily Gentiles. We'll get to that in just a minute. We know the story as he headed out onto the other side, the, the winds and the rain came and where was Jesus? He was sleeping. You remember that, right? He was sleeping. I can't imagine this. How can Jesus be sleeping? And and if you know the size of the boat, this was not a large boat he was in. It's not like he was in a luxury liner going across the Sea of Galilee and he's sleeping. Jesus had amazing peace in the midst of the storms. And the, the disciples woke him up and said, Jesus, we're about to die here. And Jesus got up and said, Hey, guys, have a little faith. Now, listen to me. I I would have been with the disciples that night. I would not have been with Jesus. I'd have been saying, Jesus, please save us. And Jesus did. 
In the morning, they arrived on the other side of the lake. Now, this is the, the story about the demoniac, this guy. He, he's, he's naked. He's, he's demon-possessed. They've tried to, to bind him before. He's broken the, the, the chains, and, and he runs around, and he, he terrorizes people. And he comes up to Jesus, and he knows who Jesus is. And, and Jesus casts the demons out of him. And we know the story. We've heard it before in Sunday school and sermons. The demons go over the nearby herd of pigs. And these herd of pigs, they run down the, 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 the hill and they jump into the lake and they all drown. And the pig herders, they, they go into town and they tell the people what's going on. And they come out. And, and instead of looking and seeing this demoniac who had been out of his mind for who knows how long sitting there in his right mind, they see the drowned pigs. Now, I get it. That's their livelihood. But they're more concerned about the pigs than they are about the man. Jesus is always more concerned about the men or the women or the children. Now, now get this. Understand this again. We missed this context. Jesus had left a whole crowd of people on one side of the lake to get in a boat and go overnight to the other side in the middle of a storm just so he could heal one person. And even when he healed that person, they asked him to leave. That's Jesus. <laughs> Jesus does things like that. So Jesus gets in his boat and he goes back over to the other side of the river, or of the lake. Now, when he gets on the other side, this is where we're getting into chapter 5. When he gets on the other side, this whole crowd gets back to him. And a, a number of people probably were on the you know, same people who were there the day before who had been with him and had, had heard him teaching. And, and so he comes back to the other side. Now, again, there's a crowd of people, but there are three key characters in the rest of this chapter that I want us to focus on. Really, two key characters, Jesus and this woman. But there's this other man named Jairus. And Jairus is the leader of the local synagogue. And the local synagogue is like the local church. Right? Not just the church. It's the, not, not just any church. It's the church. I mean, Jairus is like the pastor of First Baptist Church, Waynesburg. I mean, it's the main church downtown. It's the, the main church that people go to. It's the main church people know about. And so Jairus comes to Jesus and says to Jesus, hey, my daughter's dying. Can you come heal my daughter? Now, it's likely Jairus had been part of these Jews who were trying to get rid of Jesus. Because we know that throughout the scriptures, leaders of Jews were trying to get rid of Jesus because he was bringing people to his, his camp, to his group, to his understanding of who God was. But now Jairus has a need. And Jairus comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, please Heal my daughter. I don't know about you, but I can imagine the disciples probably saying to Jesus, Hey, Jesus, here's a great opportunity. You've got this huge crowd of people around you. You've got Jairus, the local key leader of the, of the main church in town, coming to you, asking for your help. Jesus, this is going to help our cause. We're going to get more people ready to follow you, ready to come after you. Jesus, you have to do this. You have to do this. This is going to help your popularity. <laughs> but we know that Jesus is never in it for popularity. Jesus decides to go with Jairus, not because of popularity, because he's about to become very unpopular, actually. Our second character, our main character of this story, actually Jesus is always the main character, right? We're in church, so we have to say that. Jesus is always the main character. But the other character in this story, this woman, is in the crowd. She's the one playing hide and seek with Jesus. Why was this woman hiding from Jesus? You know, most of the people Jesus healed, they called out to him. Hey, Jesus, I'm healed. Or, or most of the people, their friends brought him to Jesus. They tore open roofs and lowered people to Jesus. Most of the people somehow got Jesus' attention to be healed. 
but not this woman. Why not? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why didn't she just come up to Jesus and say, Jesus, I've, I've had this bleeding for 12 years. Please heal me. Well, I think there's three things that we need to understand about this, this story to help us understand what's going on here. Three major strikes against this woman. First was this, that she was a woman in, in a male-dominated culture. I'm sure most of you have heard before that women were not the favored gender in, in biblical times. As a matter of fact, there was a common prayer for Jewish men that prayed each morning. During that time, they prayed, God, thank you for not making me a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. Wow. That's pretty extreme. I'm not going to take all the time or take time to list all the barriers that existed, but here's one barrier we've got to understand in this story. To understand this story, women were not allowed to approach men in this culture unless they were related to this man. So culturally, it was inappropriate for this woman, even though she had this huge need, it was culturally inappropriate for her to go to Jesus and say, Jesus, please help me. Please heal me. She'd never met Jesus before. She didn't know Jesus. Jesus didn't know her. Culturally, she should, could not go to Jesus. The second strike this woman had against her was her illness. Now, our translation today calls it a hemorrhage. But the Greek goes a little bit deeper. It, it, it was a feminine bleeding that she had. I, I'm just going to say it that way to make it as as nice as I can. It was a feminine bleeding that she had, that she'd had for 12 years. And here's what Leviticus says about that. Leviticus 15, 25 says this, when a woman has a discharge of blood for many days at a time, other than her, her monthly period, or has a discharge that, contains, or that continues beyond her period, she will be unclean as long as she has this discharge. Understand this, folks. This woman had been ceremonially unclean for 12 years, which meant that she could not participate in com community events. She could not interact with other people. If she touched someone else or if somebody else touched her, and they knew about her bleeding, they would become ceremonially unclean as well. She could not go to any local worship service that was going on. She could not participate in the community. Listen, we just went through two and a half years of COVID where we had to be separated and distance. And, and, and any psychologist today will tell you one of the biggest effects of that was loneliness that exists in society today as a result. This woman was isolated for 12 years without any contact with others. She wasn't just longing for physical healing, folks. She was longing for emotional healing and religious healing and social healing. A third strike this woman had against her was her illness, or, or, or was a result of her illness. It was that she was poor. When I read the scripture earlier, we said that she'd lost all her money. Now, it indicates she had had some money at some point, but she'd spent it all on doctors who couldn't cure her. And so now she was poor. She had no social status. She had no financial status. She had no religious status. She was as low as lonely, as isolated, as despised as she could be. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever been at a time in your life of utter loneliness and hurt and despair? The point where you might have thought, gosh, what else can happen to me? What else can I go through? Does anyone care? Does anyone even notice me? If you've ever been at that point, you know what this woman feels at this moment. 
I hope this story will give you some hope as we'll find in these next few words. When she was at her lowest, she went looking for Jesus. When she was at her lowest, she went looking for Jesus. She heard that he was back in town, that he was on his way to Jairus' daughter, the leader of the local, I mean Jairus' house to heal his daughter, the leader of the local synagogue. But how was she going to get Jesus to notice her? She couldn't approach Jesus. She couldn't go up to him. How would she get Jesus, Jesus to, to notice her? Now, there was a saying in that day, and some people believed it. Not everybody did, just like today. Some people believe certain things. Other people don't. But there was a saying that day among some Jewish uh, leaders that if you simply touched the hem of the garment of a rabbi, that that could transmit healing to her. So she tried everything else. So I'm sure she's at home thinking, man, if I can just touch Jesus' garment... Touch the hem of his garment. Maybe that will. I've tried everything else. I've gone to all the doctors. I've done everything. I've prayed. Let me just touch Jesus. Touch his garment. So I'm sure, I'm, I'm guessing this is what it looked like. She's at her home. She wraps up. She puts stuff over her head so people don't recognize her, don't see who she is. She's happy there's a crowd there that day. She's happy there's a lot of people because she wants to kind of inch her way in between the people because she wants to play hide and seek with Jesus. She wants to inch her way up there and just reach out and touch him so that she can be healed. And that's exactly what she does. And that's exactly what happens. I, I, I love the passage here. I've got to get my glasses out again. These words are getting smaller all the time. Anybody else recognize that? No. Listen to these words again. It says in uh, verse 28, there's the thought, but if I touch his clothes, I will be made well. Verse 29, listen to this. Immediately, her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Wow. She knew it. It happened. She felt it. It worked. Can you imagine how excited she must have been? I'm sure she probably wanted to throw off the covering she had on, but she still knew, I can't do that. I still got to be covered up. Man, what a great story. So I read this passage a couple of years ago and was studying this, it occurred to me, why did Jesus do what he did? Why did Jesus stop and, and say, healing has gone out from me? Why did he call her out in front of everybody? I mean, think about this. This woman was healed. She got what she wanted to have happen to her. She was healed. Nobody noticed. Nobody saw anything. Everything was good. She could have walked back through the crowd. She could have gone home. Jesus was God. Jesus knew what happened. Jesus says Jesus knew healing went out from him. Why did Jesus call her out? Wow. That's a question when it hit me. I thought, I don't get it. I don't understand it. Until I studied a little bit more of his response. Look again at the very end. Verse 34, it says, he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Go in shalom. It's a special Jewish word, Hebrew word. Go in peace. Be healed. Here, yeah, I'm reading between the lines. I think we can, I'm going to ask Jesus this when we get to heaven. But here's what I read in the lines, in between the lines when I see this. The word daughter is specifically a term of endearment. Now understand this. This woman was probably older than Jesus. She'd been bleeding for 12 years. Jesus is probably, this beginning of his ministry, probably around 30 years old. She may be older than Jesus. And yet he refers to her as daughter. It's a term of endearment. And I'm sure that Jesus said it with 
compassion in his eyes. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Now go in shalom. Go in peace. Now the word shalom, the idea of peace in, in uh, Hebrew was not just a, a sense of peace in the body. It was a sense of peace within the community. Here's what I think Jesus is doing. This woman has been ostracized for 12 years in the eyes of this community. And even if she would have slipped away and gone back home and realized within herself that she was healed, I'm sure there were people in the community that would have said, no, you're not, you're not really healed. Come on, you're just, you're just believing that. You can't touch a garment of somebody's cloak and be healed. That's not going to work. Surely not. And I'm sure the ostracization, that's a hard word to say, still would have happened. Jesus doesn't just bring physical healing. And I would suggest to you, Jesus doesn't primarily bring physical healing. I love it when I'm able to pray with people and we see some type of physical healing happen in, in their lives. That's wonderful. And I'm going to keep praying for physical healing for people. But Jesus is more interested in spiritual healing than physical healing. Jesus is more interested in emotional healing than physical healing. Jesus is more interested in social healing, relational healing than he is physical healing. I think what Jesus did when he called this woman out is he wanted to elevate her back into the community. He wanted her to know that her relationship was right with God. And he wanted her to know that her relationship was right. Not just her, but everybody else. That her relationship was right with everybody else as well. Because now she was no longer unclean. Go in peace. Are you in bondage today? Are you in bondage today? Bondage to fear. Bondage to loneliness. Bondage to shame. Bondage to memories. Bondage to disease. Maybe you're in bondage to broken relationships. If so, let me encourage you to look for Jesus and ask him to set you free. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest.